Uh, we're going to start grand rounds today. Dr. Gungor is here. Dr. Gungor is head of pediatric otolaryngology, um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, surgeries of pediatric airway. Thank you. Dr. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming in so early. I hope more will come. Um, today I want to talk to you about what I do <coughs> and why the pediatric airway is so important to me. This is uh, actually one of my typical patients. Um, I see myself as an extension of the pediatricians. A lot of the things that I do is the uh, ear, nose and throat primary care, but uh, the reason for my existence is the uh, uh, pediatric airway and its surgical treatment. Why the pediatric airway? Why is it so different? Why do we ha need uh, specialists that's, that only do pediatric airways? First of all, most of the pediatric codes are due to respiratory origin, so there's a uh, high prevalence of respiratory events. Majority of them occur at less than one year of age. Most one-year-olds, most uh, uh, kids younger than one-year-old do not tolerate surgical procedures very well, so you have to sort of specialize in these very difficult cases, very brittle kids. And 80% of pediatric cardiopulmonary arrests are due to respiratory distress. So there's a definite need. Of course, if you don't employ me gainfully, I, I do go around and do such funny things around. Uh, my out-of-work interests, again, revolve around ear, nose, and throat, although in different venues. Today I want to talk to you about the pediatric airway because in the past uh, 10 years or so we have uh, major changes in our subspecialty. We have new treatment paradigms brought on by technology and uh, <coughs> new preferences, uh, the widespread use of internet that changes and shapes uh, patient preferences, parental uh, uh, levels of information. So they push you towards more conservative techniques. Uh, there are also new uh, and unique uh, problem prevention techniques that I want to talk to you about. I'm hoping that uh, after you learn about the unique features of the pediatric airway and the uh, outcomes uh, of procedures, uh, we will all come to an understanding of uh, employing better airway management practices, uh, especially uh, for those who, who treat uh, babies in the ICUs, uh, NICUs. Very briefly, I'm, I promise I won't be boring you too, uh, too much with detail. This is the uh, dorsal uh, anatomy, this is the ventral anatomy. Uh, here's the epiglottis, uh, here are the arytenoids. We have corniculate uh, cartilages. And we have a <coughs> uh, post-cricoid area that's very important in our uh, specialty. Uh, you know that the innervation, uh, etc., comes from the superior inferior laryngeal nerves. This is a normal anatomy showing you a bronchoscopy uh, with a rigid bronchoscope. Here's the subglottis, which is the most narrowest part of the pediatric airway. These are uh, horseshoe-shaped uh, incomplete tracheal cartilages. Here's the carina, right main stem, left main stem. Uh, you have to have a very good eye memory of what's normal to determine what's abnormal because uh, you only have a few brief seconds to determine uh, the pathology. We have the recurrent laryngeal nerve innervating both motor and sensory uh, uh, functions and the blood supply comes from the laryngeal branches of superior inferior thyroid arteries. Uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is very important because it's very vulnerable to trauma, especially cardiac procedures, neck procedures, difficult deliveries, uh, breach presentations. So anytime you have any <coughs> uh, suspicion about the vocal cord function, uh, you have to have a uh, direct uh, visual examination of the vocal cords to determine if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is intact. Uh, the majority of the uh, injuries are due to its long course uh, around the uh, major vessels. The pedi pediatric airway is different in many ways. These are only the uh, 
six that are very, very uh, prominent. Other than those, of course, there's the immaturity issue, the softness issue, the high respiratory rate, etc. But I want to uh, briefly touch uh, on every single <coughs> one with some illustration to make it a little more uh, <coughs> uh, clear. In the adult, the uh, larynx is a lot lower uh, around C4 and 5, and in the pediatric, it's around C2 and 3. Uh, around age 12 to 14, this uh, uh, descent uh, will be near complete. So it's a, a spectrum. But the younger babies, whenever they open their mouth, you can actually see the epiglottis in the back of the throat. That's why. So you have to be very careful with your instruments. As soon as you put your laryngoscope in, you're actually hitting the larynx. Uh, it's, it's a mistake that many uh, junior uh, Anesthesi anesthesiologists uh, do or uh, our residents do. We, we teach them to go very, very slow, use the smallest instrument possible because those injuries, especially with a, uh, a straight blade, can be very severe. You can actually uh, hit and tear the vallicula if you're not careful. Second uh, dif difference is that the uh, babies have a relatively larger tongue and tongue base and they're obligate nasal breathers. So if there's anything wrong with the nasal passages, the large tongue base uh, won't allow them to compensate by oral breathing for very long. They can do it, but that's very long. It's very difficult, very um, elaborate. Uh, it requires a lot of effort. And therefore, uh, the tongue base is always in your way. So if you want to intubate the baby, you have to realize that you have to use some maneuver to keep the tongue base a little bit out of your view. In adults, it's not such a big problem. The another reason the pediatric uh, intubations can go wrong is there is a, a different angle between the vocal cords and the anterior larynx. In the, in the baby, it's more acute. So in adults, even if you don't see the vocal cords in their entirety, if you see the vicinity of the vocal cords of the larynx, you can sort of blindly intubate and it will go through. In babies, if you don't see it, you won't get it because the tube will be inadvertently uh, guided into the anterior larynx and it will basically force itself through the anterior commissure and uh, injure it. You won't, you won't intubate. The epiglottic shape is very different. Uh, over uh, the course of the first decade, it uh, flattens and it's uh, more uh, rigid. But in the first few years, it's very floppy and has an omega shape that's very acute. Therefore, it's very prone to collapse if the respiratory demand is increased. So you always have to look at the larynx uh, uh, in a, a dynamic exam. This is what it looks like before the inspiration begins. This is mid inspirium this is end inspirium co complete collapse. Uh, these cartilages are not strong enough to support uh, such vigorous breathing activity. Another difference is the shape of the larynx. In adults, it's straight cylindric, so what you see is what you get. If you can pass anything through the vocal cords, it will pass through the rest of the airway. In kids, the cricoid is the uh, narrowest part. So anything that passes through the vocal cords may not pass through the cricoid. It, it, if it's too big, it will just uh, lodge itself here. And that's where most of the injury due to uh, intubation occurs. And this develops around 10, 12 years of age. That's the reason why most anesthesiologists uh, and ICU attendings prefer uncuffed tubes because they uh, actually have uh, less propensity to cause damage in the cricoid, especially when there is the possibility of uh, self-extubation on a ventilator. Um, there is another aspect of the anatomy that uh, has been obscure for, uh, I don't know, for many reasons or for the reasons that I really don't understand, but this is never mentioned, uh, but it's fairly important, especially in surgical specialties. In, in, the, in the baby, in the children, the, the hyoid bone is so close, uh, it almost overlaps the thyroid cartilage. 
So if you're looking for a surgical landmark uh, before procedure, forget about the thyroid membrane. But it's classic textbook information. To uh, uh, get your bearings straight, you have to first identify the thyroid membrane. Not so in kids. You don't have this landmark in kids. This will appear much later. So you have to rely on the hyoid bone itself and maybe the uh, inferior notch of the thyroid cartilage, but not the superior notch, not the uh, thyrohyoid membrane. Our examinations can be flexible and rigid. Here is uh, one examination through the uh, uh, LMA. This shows the postcricoid area, interarytenoid. Here's vocal cords, ventricles, subglottis, tracheal rings, you can get the same information through a rigid bronchoscope. Rigid bronchoscope is a little bit more traumatic than flexible, but if you're skilled, if you're careful, uh, there's very minimal damage. Here you can see that the very narrow part of the airway is the cricoid area. I'm showing you these over and over again because I want you to get an eye for what's normal because there's pathology to come later on. There are also major differences in the respiratory physiology. I'm preaching to the choir here, maybe. Uh, there's uh, low surfactant before 35 weeks of age, so you have to factor that in. Um, respiratory distress syndrome is very real in babies, especially in prematures. Oxygen consumption is high, twice that of adults. So the kids have a very high respiratory rate, and uh, any increased demand on respiration is uh, compensated by increasing the respiratory rate. They can't increase their tidal volume. Babies also lack type 1 muscle fibers, so they uh, fatigue very easily. So it's, it may be minutes before a kid uh, uh, decompensates and requires ventilatory assistance. You have to be very careful. Um, for all of these reasons mentioned in the previous 10 slides, kids are very vulnerable to hypoxia, to apnea, and for, to anesthesia. So you have to be very, very careful. Uh, basically, anybody who does pediatric airway is an obsessive, compulsive, neurotic, paranoid person. They try to keep it under control. The first year, uh, lung development is rapid, but it only culminates around 10, 12 years of age. Uh, the terminal saccules are, in the first year of life, about a tenth of an adult, and they also develop fully around 18 months of age. So up to two years you are developing with a, you, you're, you're dealing with a very, very immature uh, organism. A few things from uh, physics, how air moves through tubes or how fluids move through tubes. We have, a, we have a two principles, one is the Bernoulli principle, one is the Pozois law. Here you can see it demonstrated. Um, if you have laminar flow, usually uh, the uh, uh, parts of the fluid or the uh, gas that are in contact with the surface move the slowest, uh, whereas the ones that are close to the uh, center of the lumen move the fastest. And if there is any kind of obstruction, however small, it will cause a turbulence that will actually have uh, effects on the uh, flow much more than you could predict with, by, with, by the size of the obstruction. So even a small obstruction can cause a major turbulence, therefore uh, the flow will uh, cease to exist in, in physiologic uh, numbers. Here you can see how smoke rises without turbulence. This is laminar flow. Any kind of turbulence, this rise is interrupted. There's no more flow in the direction you want it. The turbulence creates uh, cessation of flow. So even minor uh, artifacts, minor bumps in the airway can uh, affect the airflow severely. And this is very true in the baby's airway because they're very soft and uh, they're, they can be compressed 
in several places. This is a barren innominate artery where it can compress it. A double aortic arch can compress it, pulmonary artery sling, vascular sling, vascular anomalies in the right trachea. The atrium can be big and compress it. So any of those minor compressions will cause uh, severe limitations of flow. So you have to be aware of those. Most of them uh, do not continue to impair the airway because kids grow out of it, but sometimes they need uh, surgical intervention to fix it. Also, there is the uh, problem of the radius. In, in, in an adult airway that is, let's say, eight millimeters wide, one millimeter of edema uh, reduces the flow about 44%. The same amount of edema will reduce a four millimeter infant airways flow uh, about 75%. So these are very important. That also actually uh, helps us design surgical uh, uh, interventions. <coughs> Even if you do very little, you can achieve a lot. You have to make sure that you do it in the proper uh, areas. One more boring slide, and after that, it's all videos, I promise. Uh, here's how we classify the uh, airway obstructions. Uh, Dr. Cotton from Cincinnati is one of our <coughs> uh, senior uh, airway surgeons who has brought his experience to uh, most of us. Uh, grade one is up to 50% obstruction. We don't do any surgical interventions on these. Um, it's a little subjective to determine what's 50% and what's 51%, but in practice, uh, we don't really uh, find it too difficult here. Uh, numerically, it's uh, pretty hard to explain. Uh, somewhere between 50 and 70% obstruction we graded as two, and anything above that is grade three. Grade three and grade four really do not matter because neither can breed. For grade uh, two, we have more conservative techniques in surgery. For grade three and four, we have mostly open invasive surgical procedures. This is what an airway looks like after a traumatic intubation. Most of us, uh, before we see these pictures, think of traumatic intubation as a scratch injury. It's not so. In, in the kid, a traumatic intubation can lift off entire segments of mucosa in the most unfortunate places like this in the uh, subglottis. These don't heal very well. So any traumatic intubation, any self-extubation of a baby, especially with the cuff up, any baby who is on the ventilator with inappropriate setting, settings, fighting the ventilator, will cause trauma that can be extensive as this. And these are very hard to fix. That's how they heal. This is about 75, 80% loss of lumen. Uh, it's a concentric scar. This baby breeds, but that's all he does. They, they, the baby doesn't eat, doesn't grow, doesn't talk, doesn't do anything else. Just focuses on breathing. This is the concentric scar. This is my suction tip here. In a, in a circular environment, anything you do heals with the concentric scar. So eventually, and gradually, it will get smaller. So luckily, we can address these with balloons. Here's a balloon that, well, I have a better video later on. But those balloons are very rigid balloons. You can't pinch them with your fingers, even if you're really burly and strong. They're very hard, and they uh, gradually increase the uh, pressure in a radial way, which is thought to cause uh, less stretch trauma, less collagen deposition after that, and we have been using these extensively for the past uh, five, six years. Stop the work. There you go. Dr. Ko is very familiar with this. Dr. Ko, what is this? Do you know? <laughs> now, this is a very complex environment. I, I, don't, I, I don't even pretend to tell you that I understand all of this, but what I, what I know is uh, these variables are so difficult to uh, adjust 
uh, get it right, and if you don't, the babies will suffer. This is a very high-tech environment. Every single one of these instruments have their own 300-page uh, uh, user's guides. I don't understand any of it. What I see is the end result of poorly adjusted ventilators, ventilator settings. These are our problem practices that makes babies come to me or me come to them. Um, first of all, any baby who requires assistive ventilation, you have to pick a tube that's properly sized. If there are any associated conditions like Down syndrome and craniofacial malformation, whatever you think is right, go one size down because they uh, almost always have a smaller airway than peers. Premature babies go one size down. Do the smallest. I know Dr. Ko will uh, recommend use the biggest tube that you can pass through because it improves ventilation dynamics, oxygenization, and the tracheal tube diameter directly interferes with the volume that you can exchange, but there's a downside to it, if, especially if you use a cuff tube. Go down, go slow. You can always upsize, but once the injury is there, you can't go downsize and it's expected to make everything better. Um, any associated condition um, that uh, makes the baby more brittle, like sepsis, intracranial, uh, anomalies, any kind of infections, uh, those will make the babies more vulnerable to improper tube size. Prolonged intubation. If you have three experts, you will have four or five opinions on this. <laughs> uh, every, every specialist thinks uh, their, their own number holds because in practice, that's what they observe. A few things. Uh, there is no set number. Two weeks is not true for all babies. Ten weeks may not be too long for some babies. Uh, it all depends what kind of tube you use, what kind of anomaly the baby has, what kind of ventilator settings you have, uh, what kind of nursing care you have after you leave. Is there continuity of care in the same standard? Um, so you have to uh, basically be in communication with your own uh, departments, with your own specialists. Uh, in, in, in ENT, we are always taught that two weeks is when you start thinking about the tracheotomy. But I have experienced that even in three, four days, you can cause severe trauma if you don't adjust your variables right. And there are babies who can remain on the ventilator with proper settings for a couple of months, and there's no injury, no trauma. So um, synchronization, you have to observe the baby you have to synchronize your ventilator settings. You can't have a baby that fights the ventilator. It's wrong for other reasons too, but a baby fighting a ventilator always creates trauma that's repetitive. Any movement on the tube will cause uh, this trauma. Self-extubation, uh, one of the problems we are called for. When you receive the consult, that says the baby self extubated six times. We immediately start thinking, poor care. That's poor care. There's no excuse to it. If, if a baby self extubates, either the ventilator settings are wrong, the baby wasn't adequately immobilized, paralyzed, sedated, or somebody just yanked the tubes out. If you yank a tube out, especially a cuff tube out, through the cord, through the cricoid, you take all the mucosa with it. So the extent of trauma can be very severe, and not all of these kids can be treated well. Uh, cough protocols are very important. If you use a cuffed tube, never ever leave the cuff unattended. You have to have one person dedicated to that cuff every 10, 20, 30 minutes, whatever your cuff protocol is. It has to be deflated. A cuff cannot stay inflated more than a couple hours. After that, you cause necrosis. In a training hospital, it's important that everybody is very skilled, but it's very hard to attain. So there, there, there are risks that you're taking in a training hospital. So you just have to be very obsessive, compulsive, and paranoid about who does what to your kid. You have to be all over. And continuity of care, 
uh, after hours matter? Once the attending is gone, once the doctors are gone, what, what do your nurses do? Or what do your residents do? You have to teach them adequately. I'm not saying all the blame is to the ancillary personnel, residents. It's, it's all on us, but we have to be in control of that. I've been here three years, and all my experience with the Louisiana uh, general population has been extremely positive. This is one very good example of that. I asked her to make a crawfish face for me, and she's considering. She's thinking about something nice. She's trying really hard. But it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, there it is. And this is the bonus. <laughs> she was awesome. Okay, any questions so far? I'm going to talk to you about the airway surgical protocols now. Before the 70s, we didn't have those nice optical instruments, the scopes, telescopes, etc. We had the bronchoscopes. We used to look through that other end, whatever we could see at the tip, we tried to treat with bougies. Bougies are basically dilators. We call them violators. They, they, they didn't give us very good results. Up to the 2000s, we did mostly open airway surgeries, expansion grafting, resections. After 2000, we had better scopes, uh, we had better endoscopic techniques. Dr. Cotton helped a lot. and. Uh, we had many, many technological advances. So from open surgery, we moved to endoscopic surgical procedures. We use them in combination. We have a lot better stents, uh, very thin lumen, very uh, thin walled, large lumen pediatric stents. We have excellent lasers. We have micro debriders. We have mechanical equipment that allows us to see more, better, and longer. Uh, we have more accumulated experience. A lot of pediatric uh, ENT fellowships are training more and more uh, skilled surgeons on pediatric airway. And the families, they read up. They come to you with the options for you to use. They, they tell you what they want. It's, it's, it's actually uh, really a uh, fantastic experience. However, the general philosophies have not changed. Even if we use the most advanced techniques, they're still going to be failure because they're very difficult. You have to prepare the family for complications and failures, and there will be many. Don't, rec uh, uh, don't promise anybody anything that's going to happen anytime soon. Just prepare them. Uh, although you want to use endoscopic and conservative techniques, be prepared to have open approaches during the same setting. So our, cons uh, or our consent forms say possible laser, possible balloon, possible endoscopy, possible laser, uh, possible stent, possible trach, possible cricotracheal resection. Everything is on there. So during the procedure, you can uh, have the uh, freedom to choose whatever is mo most appropriate. Uh, Something we have learned over the years is that we, we go incrementally more aggressive. We don't want to burn bridges. If you, if you can get away with a simpler procedure, do that first. Something that wouldn't uh, preclude other procedures to be done later. That's what we do. Uh, with your conservative cases, start with the easier ones, the soft scar, the fresh scar, uh, the younger uh, injuries, the thinner. Uh, bands. And you have to be aware of your environment. If you don't have good PICU, NICU, if you don't have good support personnel, especially uh, residents, don't attempt to go because these kids require 24-7 care and you can't be there 24-7. These are all the pathologies that we can address with endoscopic airway surgical procedures. And uh, I want to talk to you briefly about balloons because you're going to hear more and more about them. Uh, although there's very aggressive uh, marketing tactics for the balloons, uh, 
not all kids and not all specialties and not all specialists uh, should use balloons. Not all pathologies require balloons and there are downsides. But when you look at the brochures, when you look at the papers, balloons are promoted as uh, you stick it in one body orifice and it will make everything better kind of thing. Not so. You have to pick your patients very selectively. Uh, again, they're better for uh, soft, soft, fresh, young injuries and thin pathologies. Make sure that you're not trying to dilate cartilage, you can't. And make sure that there is no uh, necrotic Malaysia cartilage because those balloons will not work on them. Everybody's results are lumped together in a big soup, so you have to work your way through what's right, what's wrong. You can use them in very uh, different settings where uh, conservative surgery wasn't possible before, but you have to make sure that there are, there is a potential for disaster, and not there aren't many uh, studies showing these, but uh, there will be more. These are the balloons up close. You have basically a pressure transducer. You can measure it. You can lock it, and it's transferred through the balloon. These uh, balloons are, uh, come in different sizes, depending on uh, what you want to achieve. You use a specific sh type of balloon. And you can use them as a primary treatment, complementary adjunctive treatment. You can use it in the nose, in the pharynx, in the larynx, in the trachea bronchial system, in your esophagus. You can use it as helpers for your stent pl placement. Uh, these are made of very high tensile strength material but they can burst, and when they burst, they can explode in the airway. Uh, the manufacturer uh, swears that there are no pieces coming out, but I have personally observed that it bursts into pieces, so. These are our videos now. I wanna show you what we do in the OR once we take your baby. Um, here's a laryngeal papilloma that's being treated with a KTP laser. You can see the pulses pounding. It's like a video game, really. Here's another laryngeal papilloma that's going to be treated with a micro debreather, which very much resembles the early video game Pac Man. Goes chop, 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 chop. And here you see Sidofovir injection into where the into the area where the papilloma once was. Sidofovir is an antiviral that's been very, very effective controlling uh, the human papilloma virus, the recurrent laryngeal papillomas in, in children. So you can remove pathology in many ways. This is the uh, micro debreather. It chops and sucks uh, with very little trauma to adjacent tissue. The problem with these procedures is if you go too aggressive, you can actually hurt the underlying anatomy. After past adolescence, papillomas will be gone, but your injuries will be there for life. So you have to be very conservative, very uh, gentle with these tissues. Um, in most large pediatric ENT training programs, there are two or three kids with laryngeal papillomas it was when I was training, not anymore, I believe. Uh, they were frequent flyers. They would come in every two, three weeks, and every single fellow of pediatric ENT would get their airway training, laser training with them. So, and here we have a laryngomalacia. You can see that these arytenoid cartilages are flopping into the airway during inspiration. It's a very dynamic exam. Now you suspend it with a rigid bronchoscope, you fix everything in place, and you start addressing the floppy mucosa with a micro debreather here. <coughs> Just a few cuts are enough to remove the floppy mucosa. Then you can cut these aryepiglottic folds and make the epiglottis move forward, opening up the airway. Here is a laryngeal 
cleft that will be addressed with the laser and suturing. Again, this is all normal anatomy. And this is a tracheoesophageal fistula right here at the carina. Nice pathologies to find and relatively easy to fix if you have a good pediatric surgeon who will take the case <laughs> from you. Here's another way of addressing uh, laryngomalacia. You can cold divide the aryepiglottic fold in order to allow the epiglottis to move forward. Remember again, if you make just one millimeter of difference in the opening of the airway, you can increase the flow 10 times. That's, that's the principle. You do very little to achieve a lot, but you have to do it in the right places. Here you have to make symmetrical cuts. If you do too much, it will scar down or it will promote reflux. You don't want that. This CT shows a unilateral coanal atresia, which is largely membranous. And this is a cool video to show you how endoscopically it can be repaired. Here's the uh, back end vomer. Here's where the adenoids would be. This is the posterior end of the middle turbinate. Here's your instrument poking through. Again, this is a micro debrider through the membranous part. <coughs> and it will gradually chop away the membranous bony parts and remove the vomer here to create an opening. You won't see anything from the outside. It's completely endoscopically performed. Here you see a balloon dilation. This is in the subglottis. Previous laser cuts are made. We call it the Mercedes star tricut. Once you cut them, it's ready to accommodate your balloon and then you expand it. The difference between <coughs> a uh, circular dilation versus a radial dilation is that on histology examination, uh, the collagen deposition patterns are different. So after balloon dilation where the radial expansion has taken place, there is less concentric scarring after that. That's the entire principle. Now, there's no shearing forces. You can leave the balloon in for as long as your anesthesiologist can tolerate uh, desaturation. You can go down to 90% and then have to remove the balloon and you may have to repeat it. Uh, most young, fresh, thin, uh, pathologies respond to this very well, so it has saved a lot of kids from open, extensive surgical procedures. Here is a subglottic cyst addressed with the KTP laser. And this is a laryngeal cleft. We're going to denude this mucosa and then put a stitch through it to clear it. Denuding can be done cold or with a laser. Uh, you try to remove only as much mucosal surface as needed. Don't want to go into the arytenoids themselves. This video shows multiple cysts in the subglottis. They tend to come back. They can actually uh, be initiated by brief periods of intubation. So if a kid has uh, respiratory distress a few weeks after an, uh, an intubation, you have to uh, make sure that there are no cysts building. After denuding of the mucosa here, you put the stitch through, and it will get rid of that valley, that deep valley that's uh, causing the laryngeal cleft. You see the cysts here, multiple cysts. And this is after laser surgery. You do these uh, probably a couple times before they stop coming back. Open procedures, tracheotomy, again, it's our workhorse. Anytime you have more than uh, two airway pathologies, it's best to uh, bypass them and uh, do a tracho tracheotomy, wait for the kid to grow. Sometimes they grow out of their pathology, sometimes they just grow sturdier so you can uh, operate on them 
in a safer way. If all else fails uh, after the tracheotomy and you can't do any endoscopic uh, treatment that is successful, you can do something we call the partial cricotracheal resection, which is basically bypassing and removing the segment uh, where there's stenosis and then attaching it directly to the larynx. The pitfall here is to preserve the laryngeal nerves on both sides as well as the mucosa inside, so you have to make sure that this technique uh, is done diligently. Not, not everybody, uh, not every patient uh, is a good candidate for this. You have to have good lungs, you have to have good vocal cord motion, you have to have uh, arytenoids that aren't fixated. So a lot of prerequisites are here. So patient selection process is very important. Who word about tracheotomies? In, in kids, it's very different than in adults. In kids, you have, well, in adults too, you have this large uh, fat pad that you need to get rid of, which we don't see in many adults, but in, in obese patients we do. Uh, when you remove this fat pad, it makes it so much easier to find your plane. Also, after surgery, when there is uh, accidental decantillation, it makes it so much easier for the personnel to find the lumen back. So that's done first. Uh, in, the, in children, we make a vertical incision in the trachea. We don't remove any cartilage. It would be a big mistake to remove any cartilage rings. In adults, we routinely do. We remove cartilage uh, from the trachea. We make flaps with the cartilage. In kids, none of that is safe. You have to make a simple incision in the third or fourth uh, cartilage and anterior face. You have to have some supporting sutures for safety to lift it up. Most of your instruments will be too big. Uh, most of the uh, conditions after surgery will be uh, uh, difficult to put the tube back in if you don't have these safety stitches. So these safety stitches are important. Uh, over the last few years, I had the uh, chance of working with uh, pediatric faculty. We had uh, pretty good uh, publication success. Uh, this one is about a kid who failed tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, and persistent OSA. We started addressing the, those with uh, the new instrument, Coblet, which is a little fancy uh, bovi cautery, but it helps uh, speedy recovery, uh, we almost never have to uh, keep the kids in the ICU for a long time after this. So it's a new technique and we published that. Uh, some of these technological advances are actually guiding our uh, indications to, uh, again, uh, another pediatric faculty. We had the chance of working together and publishing. Any questions? <laughs> if there's no questions, there's a little plug in here. We have our pediatric uh, Louisiana cleft team brochure out. I hope everybody has received a copy already. If not, I'd be happy to send you one. Uh, the team is made of several subspecialists, orthodontists, uh, pediatric dentists, uh, child psychologists, uh, dietitians, ENT doctors, facial plastic surgeons. So it's one of the most comprehensive teams that I know of. And uh, with your support, I'm hoping to uh, make it even better. I'm trying to get some support from the Duck Dynasty people. If anybody knows them, please let me know. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be ready to put in some uh, uh, Duck Dynasty gear. And the duck call. <laughs> Any questions? Dr. Call. That's very nice. I, <clears throat> I'm not even sure the correct terminology used. Can you give us some update on the state of the art in the, about this 3D reconstruction, replacement of tracheal bronchial thing for kids with learning in Malaysia, you know, one or two years? They have started to uh, replace. 
segments of trachea, tracheal bronchial bifurcation with a uh, It comes out of a 3D printer. It's a collagen matrix. And the first kid who got it was from Scotland. I had it on another slide. And so far, it has been successful. I think that is the new way to go. A, the, the 3D printers uh, print out the collagen matrix, and you use the patient's own uh, tissue to uh, populate that matrix. One problem is you can't use two long segments because inside uh, that matrix, you don't have real mucosa, so it is prone to scarring again, so you have to transfer microflaps in there. Um, I think that's the technology to move forward because many times after these techniques uh, fail, after you have multiple surgeries and you have actually burnt your bridges, that's your only option. But uh, it's still in its infancy. A question about the uh, HPV papillomas, and, and Dr. Rokini, you may need to answer part of this too. How low down in the airway can those form, and how far down in the airways can you go to try to surgically remove them? Um, they form in transition zones. So wherever there is cuboid epithelium turning into stratified epithelium, that's the most preferred site of that papilloma to attach. And the first site is, again, vocal cords, upper parts of the airway. However, if you surgically address them, and if you scratch mucosa, if your laser bumps off and puts a little burn somewhere in the trachea, if you do a tracheotomy, you are creating a transition zone. And next time, the, because the virus is in every single cell of this entire mucosa, but once you create a transition zone, the papilloma flourishes. So next time you see the patient, you will have the papilloma there. You can go all the way down to the, to the bronchi as far as your instruments go in, uh, but once it's in the lung, you can't really do anything. You can address them wherever you can inject the sidofovir which helps tremendously, but once you have diffuse involvement of the lungs, that's a not reversible case. Dr. Bocchini? Yeah, the, the older techniques of doing the surgery were really more uh, rigid boxes and like that. That led to a lot of seeding of the lower airway, and I think with the newer technologies that you're using, you probably have less of that occurring and maybe less likelihood of getting all the way down the lungs. But these kids will have recurrent disease for years and often they get a remission when they become adolescents. But, um, but they, they're, they, they're subject to recurrent surgeries because of the regrowth of the organisms. But are these organisms different than what they get? Well, these are all caused by type 6 and 11, which is in, okay, which is in the quadrivalent vaccine. So the hope is that the quadrivalent vaccine is going to eliminate this process, but uh, we, it's too early to know. But if you prevent, I mean, most infections are transmitted maternal to infant, and so if we prevent maternal infection, we're likely going to not see this anymore. And I don't know if it's kind of early to know whether I haven't seen a new case in the last two years. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I think there's really good hope that this is going to disappear with the use of the vaccine. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Other questions? If not, I thank Dr. Gundula.